Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to welcome today Cyrus Ardalan, Chairman of the Board of IFIM, or to give it its full name, the International Finance Facility for Immunization. I would draw everyone's attention to the chat function on your hub screens. Please feel free to type in a question if you'd like to ask one, and we'll try to ask Cyrus to ask, answer them during the live Q&A session at the end. So Cyrus, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, thank you, John. Cyrus had a distinguished career in the bond market with firms including Paribas and Barclays before he joined IFIM eight years ago. Now for fans of the green bond market, IFIM is really where it all began. It issued its first bond in 2006 and introduced the idea of bonds with a specific social purpose. It is also probably the most impactful social or green bond issuer of oh. all. So Cyrus, can you just explain briefly what IFIM is and what it has achieved so far? Absolutely, thank you, John. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. Um, in uh, the year 2000, a uh, private par public partnership called Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccination and Immunization was created uh, in response to a, uh, the recognition that one of the cheapest and best ways of trying to save lives and generate income was to vaccinate children in the poorest countries. Gavi was very successful, and because of its success, in 2006, a number of countries got together, primarily under the leadership of the UK and France, to create IFIM to help accelerate the work that Gavi was doing. As a result, IFIM uh, was created where, uh, and uh, IFIM itself, uh, was a contribution of around six and a half billion dollars was made to IFIM by 10 countries over time into a financial structure. This financial structure benefited from the guarantees that are provided, uh, the pledges were uh, legally binding pledges from these countries and spread over many, many years. So for example, the UK provided uh, over $2 billion, but spread over 23 years. IFIM through its financial structure was able to obtain a uh, AAA rating. It's rated today AA because the UK has been downgraded. Uh, and was able to use its very high rating and its financial structure to issue securities in the capital markets to front load these commitments that were made by governments over many, many years. Now that had a number of very significant benefits. One, uh, it allowed uh, Gavi to benefit from six and a half billion dollars of additional resources. So therefore was able to significantly increase its activities. For example, in the several, in the four or five years after IFCOM was created, nearly 60% of Gavi's expenditures were funds provided by IFIM. Secondly, because the structure allowed countries to provide their uh, funding over many, many years, it was very attractive for countries to contribute more money to Gavi and its causes through IFIM because these could be spread over many, many years. Uh, uh, but yet, through the structure, if Gavi was able to take advantage of these either immediately or whenever it needed to have the funds. And this provided uh, Gavi with additional resources, with flexibility, and a stable long-term source of financing, which it did not have access to. For investors, it was very attractive because they were able to uh, acquire a very highly rated uh, security in the capital markets, uh, which served a pure social purpose. There's no ambiguity about what IFIM was uh, designed to do. It basically has a complete social purpose. And uh, so it basically was a win-win uh, situation. Uh, as a result of all this, uh, if you actually look at Gavi since its inception, it's vaccinated over 750 million children, saved 13 million lives, and the economic benefits are estimated to be over about a, over 150 billion. IFIM itself has issued six billion dollars in bonds in 36 different transactions and eight different currencies. Thank you. Um, it, it is it is extraordinary, really, what what has been able to be achieved. Um, and, and you've shown with IFIM that this model of combining public and private money has worked very well. For, and it's over 14 years now that, that the organization has been going. And in a way, uh, I think you could see this as an alternative model to the multilateral development banks. IFIM is obviously much lighter on structure, uh, you know, far fewer employees and so on. Um, uh, but both of them combine pub promises of public money uh, with high credit ratings and bonds that are attractive to general risk averse investors. Um, so do you think this model um, or other ones, other sort of different versions 
could be applied to other humanitarian needs? Absolutely. As you mentioned, the IFM structure itself is incredibly efficient. We have no staff. We have a board, which is, in, a, in effect, an executive board. We uh, outsource all our treasury operations to the World Bank and our governance to Gavi. Uh, in fact, the, if you look at it from a capital markets perspective, the cost of issuing securities by IFM has been lower on average over its life than the average cost of the countries that have pledged money to IFM. So it's been a very efficient uh, structure for doing so. Uh, I don't necessarily see IFM as a, um, as a substitute for uh, the multilateral development agencies, but much more as a complement. Because, and the difference is that in the case of the multilaterals and in the case of Gavi, they are essentially the implementing bodies. They are utilizing the funds uh, to provide for the services that are uh, being uh, uh, focused on. In the case of Gavi, obviously vaccinating uh, children in the poorest countries. What IFM does is that it provides a structure which allows these uh, uh, multilateral development agencies or private par public partnerships like Gavi to increase the amount of resources that are available to them to uh, execute the tasks that they have uh, at hand. And uh, as a result, I think that if a model uh, or, or other types of uh, models uh, which have a social um, basis to them have a very important role to play. And if you look at, for example, areas like sanitation, you look at areas like education, uh, obviously we've got climate, there's a whole range of social issues that need substantial amounts of money today, the benefits of which will occur over many years. So having a facility which allows uh, countries to provide the money over time, but yet have the investments made today is something which is intrinsically very attractive. I think it's also important to note that IFM is one of what I would call a family of different types of structures that could be used for social uh, purposes. For example, we have impact bonds, which uh, redistribute the risks between investors and the issuers in a very different way. You have, for example, the, um, the um, uh, IFID, which is the education, uh, the International Finance Facility for Education, which was recently set up. That uses, again, a different model. It uses guarantees provided by countries uh, which are then in turn provided to multilateral development agencies, which leverage those guarantees and provide additional resources. Again, achieves the same objective, but in a very different way. So there are multiple ways of trying to utilize financial engineering or what I would call social financial engineering to try and increase the amount of resources or the timing of resources that are available uh, for social purposes. And I think this is something which uh, has a, 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 a great, there's a great opportunity for, for doing much more in this area than we have done so, so far. But, but it all relies on uh, the political side, doesn't it, essentially? Because what, what gives IFIM its ability to front load resources and also um, to have high credit quality is um, these promises from governments. And so, um, you mentioned IFID as an example of another effort that's that's got going, but still, I think a lot of people would feel, um, you know, surveying the landscape, if him if him still on its own, you know, we haven't seen these proliferate and be copied. Is that really because it's it's difficult to get the politicians to make these pledges, and and do, you know, was there some sort of special? Um, thing about, about the moment when, when IFIM was created that, that hasn't been able to be replicated? Yeah. I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. And, I, and there are a number of different aspects to that. One, I think we have over the years made some progress. For example, we now have uh, the social uh, uh, bond principles to mirror those that were created for green bonds. We've, so we've created a bit of a sort of governance around this. The EU, for example, has the EU sustainable development strategy, which has been put in place, which is excellent. And there's recognition amongst portfolio managers of the need to include ESG as an implicit requirement within their portfolios. I think nearly over a third of uh, portfolios managed by asset managers have ESG as an explicit um, element in, in, the, in the management uh, criteria that they have to use. So there has been a lot of progress. But the reality is that uh, uh, the amount of social bonds issued, for example, if you look at that as a measure, has been relatively modest. I think if you look at 
ESG as a, as a whole class, about 250 billion were issued, I think, in 2019, of which only 6% were uh, social bonds, so relatively small. Now, why is that? I, I think there are a number of factors. One, I think it's intrinsically complex to try and create structures like IFM. You need to have all the stakeholders together. You need the governments on one side together. You need the people who access, provide access to the markets, namely the investment banks, or it could be potentially insurance companies together. And you need the governments that are providing the money together, uh, as well as obviously the institutions ultimately going to be utilizing this. All have to get together to try and come up with a structure which works. And each really brings a very different dimension to the picture. Uh, each brings their own strengths, their knowledge of certain areas, and, uh, and also a lack of understanding of other things. Mm. So trying to bring all these components together, I think, is not easy. It's time consuming. And for that to happen, you need to have very, very strong leadership. And that is, I think, mm. critical. You need somebody, in the case of IFM, it was the UK that really took a very strong uh, view on that and, and provided leadership in trying to pull this thing together. But once you pull these elements together and people are willing to devote the time and, and effort necessary, then I think you can make a, a, a great deal of progress. And um, this is something which uh, is, you know, we, for example, uh, between ourselves and the International Red Cross, we've created an informal round table to try and get humanitarian institutions who are interested in accessing capital markets together. So we begin to have an exchange of views on what it is we're trying to achieve, share our experiences, and incorporate into that forum investment banks and insurance companies, which ultimately are clearly the route to market and which we need to, to buy into. Um, the, for many of these investment banks and insurance companies, th these type of transactions are very idiosyncratic. They're very time consuming to try and structure. So they're not very attractive from a commercial point of view. That's where, again, I think if you look at it in the short run, the only way of trying to move this thing forward is to have leadership uh, at all levels, including at those, in those institutions, which says, look, this is a cause which is worthwhile. And over time, it is something which will bring huge benefits to society at large, but also could be commercially interesting to institutions as well. So you, that, in your forum, your uh, round table with the, with the Red Cross, do you have uh, commercial interests uh, represented there, investment banks or, or investors? Are they, are they interested? Yes, they, they are there and they are interested. But again, I think that, uh, you know, this is just something we've, we recently created. It's still an informal way in the process of trying to make it more formal. There's been a lot of interest in it. Uh, uh, but over time, I think um, the success of something like this will depend very much on the willingness uh, and ability, well, I think it's more willingness on the, uh, of commercial institutions to devote time and effort in helping structure something which allows us humanitarian institutions to access the capital markets and, uh, uh, and, and, and that way really uh, create a whole series of new type of uh, in financial institutions or new type of financing options, alternative structures. And that I think will take on a life of its own. I think in that as well, what is important is that with ESG becoming such an important factor uh, a growing and, and important factor in asset management per se, that itself will create increased demand for these type of securities. So hopefully that will in turn put an, another form of pressure or incentive, let me put it this way, for institutions to invest time and effort in trying to create these assets because there is a, a strong market for that. Mm. And there's one, a market which is only going to grow and grow quite rapidly in the years ahead. And are there other organizations, uh, you mentioned the Red Cross, but that have a pipeline of pledged donations that, that could uh, back a bond, or would it need to be, you know, freshly created pledges? Again, it's, uh, I think some have that. Uh, others have it in other forms. They may not be pledges, but they may be streams of income that are very certain and very stable which can be utilized for this type of purpose. Others may be, in the case of education, it's more in the form of guarantees rather than actual uh, the, uh, providing of cash. So again, what is both very interesting and what makes this complex is that there, there's no single sort of approach towards this thing. 
each institution is in a very different space. The requirements are different. Their access to support comes in a different format. So one has to sit down and see to what extent these different types of support facilities can be utilized to help access resources in the private markets. So um, I think the answer is that there are many different forms of support that are out there and it's really a question of figuring out how, how to best to mobilize those. Um, I want to ask you about uh, disasters. Yes. Because um, obviously, you know, humanitarian problems come in chronic form and uh, in acute form. And, and often, you know, the time when you can mobilize political support and public opinion is, is at a moment of crisis. Um, but obviously it's much more difficult to plan any sort of financial structure for a disaster or a, or a sudden event. And obviously, you know, the, the current pandemic is, is an example. Um, so what, do you think there's any scope for capital markets to be involved in assisting or, or strengthening a sort of ability to respond to disasters? I believe that there, uh, yes, I think that the answer is yes to that. And it can take a number of different forms. Firstly, the more institutions such as or similar to IFM we create, the more we are able to address crisis because COVID is a very good example of that. I mean, COVID came from nowhere. If IFM had not been there, then uh, there will be no means by which Gavi would be able to mobilize substantial resources very, very quickly. We'd have to go back to, to governments, et cetera, and try and seek additional funding. Whereas today, if it sits on substantial resources that can be mobilized when the time comes very, very quickly. So if you have a number of these type of facilities, whether it's if uh, uh, like if or similar to if that in itself provides a means of addressing crises as they emerge. Secondly, you can't uh, create in such, uh, entities which are purely designed to deal with crisis. For example, imagine creating an entity like FM, but where governments pledge on a contingent basis. So they make legally binding pledges, but those pledges only get triggered if a certain event occurs. And thereby you create a facility which is sitting there, and which does not draw on the resources of governments at all, but has the capacity to do so when the time comes and do so very, very quickly and provide the resources immediately, as opposed to governments trying to figure out how much you know, money is needed, how are we gonna get this from, which budgetary area is gonna come from, et cetera. And also, given the nature of IFM, that contribution by governments would be spread over many years. So it wouldn't be a, a, a large budgetary impact on the, in the year that the crisis occurs. Uh, the payment, the, 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 the cost of that would actually borne by pledges which those governments would be making over many, many years. So again, uh, given the crises are events which hopefully don't occur very often, uh, this is actually a very good way of financing it and spreading the cost of dealing with the crisis over time. So you mean a, a government could, for example, say, well, we'll pledge a hundred million dollars uh, if there's a, to be used if there's a grave earthquake or exactly. tsunami or something. And, um, then when the event happens, a bond will be issued, which can, you know, bring forward that money, but the government wouldn't have to pay it all on day one. They could spread it over 10 years or something. Exactly. The pledge would be that I would provide you 100 million spread over 10 years in increments of 10 million, let's say, every year mm -hmm. for 10 years. And that pledge sits there. It's contingent on the earthquake happening. The earthquake happens. Uh, that triggers that. So those become legally binding obligations to this entity. This entity can borrow against that, use the funds immediately to support whatever initiatives are required to deal with the earthquake. Well, thank you so much, Cyrus. We, we, we could go on talking for ages. I think um, we should stop now and just uh, see if the audience have any questions. Um, so I'm going to ask you all, in your hub screens, there's a, there's a link uh, uh, to, a, to a Zoom call. So you just click on that and then you're able to uh, ask questions either through the chat uh, or Q&A function in Zoom, or you can uh, raise your hand and uh, ask your question uh, using your own face and voice. Um, but so uh, pl please join us for that. Hello, uh, and welcome to everybody who's joined the question and answer session. 
uh, with Cyrus Ardalan. We've just heard some extremely interesting thoughts on how uh, capital markets can be uh, scaled up for social benefit uh, using innovative financial ideas. Um, and I just wanted to uh, begin, uh, Cyrus, by asking you um, what if him, how if him can help with the coronavirus, because uh, obviously your mission is vaccines. With the coronavirus, we don't have a vaccine yet, um, and also, uh, you know, preparing for future pandemics. Uh, thank you, John. If him can help in a number of different ways, and it, it has already, in fact, uh, uh, become active in this area. The first is uh, uh, in connection with the development of the vaccine. While Gavi itself is not responsible or not involved in the development of a vaccine. Gavi works very closely with an international entity which was created a few years ago called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, which was specifically set up uh, globally to try and accelerate the development of vaccines for infectious diseases, which don't necessarily get uh, initially the type of funding and support they need. Ebola, for example, is one example, and COVID is obviously uh, and now has become a critical component of that. SEPI uh, uh, has uh, uh, substantial funds of its own. It's uh, increased its funding it's quite significantly to try and accelerate the development of a vaccine for uh, COVID. It has about eight separate streams right now, uh, separate initiatives in this area. And some of the funding provided to SEPI has been provided over time, again, because it was easier for, let's say, in the case of the government of Norway, to spread its funding of SEPI over time as opposed to putting it up front. So in order to, for SEPI to be able to access this funding immediately, the funds were channeled through uh, IFIM, and IFIM was able to front load these and provide these to SEPI. And as a result of that, we've done two separate bond issues in Norwegian Krona, uh, the funds of which have been forwarded and, um, uh, to SEPI itself. So that's one way. Secondly, once a vaccine is developed, clearly um, Gavi will have a very significant role to play. One, uh, it already has set up an entity called COVAX and within that a, um, a, a window called a the AMC, which is designed to procure vaccines once these are, uh, be once the, the vaccines become available for uh, a large number of countries collectively and stockpile these and uh, ensure that one, these countries, particularly the poorest countries through the AMC, A, have uh, access to a range of different vaccines because at this stage we don't know which ones will be successful. Secondly, that the vaccines will be available to them once the vaccines uh, have been proven so that they don't, they don't end up in a situation where they don't have access to that. So this, again, is a, an important vehicle that, um, that Gabby has created and some of the funding into that may come over time and may require front loading by IFM. That's something which we're exploring. Finally, Gabby itself, uh, one of the important roles that Gabby plays is supporting domestic health systems to uh, ensure that they are fit for purpose to deliver the vaccines. And obviously the delivery of a COVID vaccine is gonna be a critical element in the range of different vaccines that Gavi will be providing to countries. And again, uh, Gavi uh, may well need to accelerate the work that it's doing there, it require additional funding. And that type of funding can be easily accessed through IFM by front loading existing pledges and increasing the amount of money that Gavi has access to. So it, it sounds like you're you're ready and able to front load any pledges that that are made at quite short notice. Is that right? Exactly. I think the key element, and, and, and that's what we discussed that earlier, is that what IFM provides is a means for countries uh, and donors to spread their uh, their contributions over time, but get the benefits of that today. And I think in the case of COVID, this is very quite valuable. And secondly, it provides Gavi with a source of funding which is very flexible and can be tapped into when specific emergencies or requirements arise, unexpected uh, requirements arise, such as COVID. And again, uh, IFM is, is in, in a way ideally suited to try and address both those. And uh, I suspect that, you know, I think, A, we've done some of that already in the context of CEPI, but I suspect that there will be more that we will be doing in that area. Okay, thank you. Now. Um, a member of the audience has asked, um, how important is the low interest rate environment that we have at the moment to IFIM's model? That's a very good question. It clearly is quite important because if you think about the IFIM model, and let's go back to uh, its, uh, uh, the days that it was created in 2006, 
when it's created, the UK government pledged close to $3 billion, but it's spread over 23 years. So uh, the net present value of that is substantially larger if interest rates are very low. So uh, in a way, uh, that I think is, is, is one of the enormous benefits of having that. Clearly, having low interest rates also impacts the amount that we earn on our liquidity. But again, whether that is a, uh, uh, a negative or not will depend very much on the shape of the yield curve and a lot of other things. But I would say that the most obvious impact would be through the front-loading mechanism itself, which takes the net present, uh, the present value of the long-term pledges that are made to FN. And I suppose if, if in the, let's take the example of that three billion pledge from the UK, they, uh, uh, is that coming in, the actual money being dispersed to IFIM or to Gavi in a schedule, of, in a schedule of payments that was agreed at the beginning and can't change? So basically, when they want to pay money, you have to take it. Yes, the, the funds, these are legally binding pledges on the part of governments, including the United Kingdom to provide a certain amount of money every year over the duration of the pledge itself. So in the case of the UK, it's 23 years, some countries provide it for 10 years, some for longer, some shorter, et cetera. So absolutely, we have, there's a fixed schedule when those come in. And what we do is we take those fixed schedules and we uh, essentially swap those into floating rate dollars and uh, therefore avoid any form of interest rate or currency risk. Uh, and then we have the capability of clearly front loading that and the amount of front loading we can do obviously increases uh, with the uh, as the interest rates come down. And obviously, the other, you know, thinking about how the IFIM model or, or some of its ideas could be extended to other applications, you know, a key a key element obviously is the reliability of the pledges, isn't it? I mean, that, that's the foundation of the whole thing. If governments have pledged money, we need to be able to trust that a subsequent government in the same country 20 years later will, will honor that. Um, can you tell us a bit about how that is guaranteed? Yeah. The, I mean, there, there are two elements to that. One is clearly the, um, the nature of the pledge itself, and these are legally binding pledges which have been approved by governments and the parliaments, etc. So they have virtually the same type of standing as the debt of the government itself. So it really carries a great deal of weight from that perspective. It is not a uh, uh, a sort of an undertaking to provide money, uh, et cetera. It's, it's, a, it's a formal legally binding pledge which has gone through all the governance requirements within the country, firstly. Secondly, there's the element of uh, the creditworthiness of the countries, obviously. The value of these pledges is, um, uh, is driven in a way by the strength, of the underlying strength of the credit of the pledger. Uh, and uh, um, the majority of the funding to, GAV, uh, to IFIM initially was provided by uh, countries such as uh, the United Kingdom and France and a number of other countries with, uh, at, that, at the time when they were created, they were AAA, now they're either AAA or AA, but they're still very, very extremely strong credits. And in fact, if you actually look at the recent uh, uh, exercise of replenishing GAVI and IFIM, uh, the uh, around four or five countries came in to the new pledge, uh, to the new round, and all of them were, were, were a very strong credits and many of them were AAA. For example, the Netherlands was in there, the Norway was in there, etc. So uh, these, again, will provide a great deal of uh, continuing strength through the underlying credit uh, standing of IFM itself. Thank you. Um, now, another question here is about the, uh, the insurance industry. Okay, and, and a, the questioner asks, a lot of people in the insurance industry have been exploring similar issues, particularly trying to design financial structures to ensure funding can be released when needed after a disaster. Um, should people working in sustainable capital markets uh, look to collaborate more with some of these pioneering insurance organizations? Absolutely, uh, I, I believe that one of the big challenges that we have right now is to ensure that the various stakeholders, various parties involved in this area work collectively together and not in individual silos. Uh, each party brings in a sort of a different perspective, a different risk uh, return requirements, uh, risk uh, appetites, etc. And by combining these together, we, I believe, can end up with structures 
that uh, address the specific requirements that we have much more effectively. And this involves on the private sector side, insurance companies and investment banks, which have access to the capital markets. On the public side, it involves governments directly and multilateral development agencies. Uh, and so, and then you've got basically the institutions, the humanitarian institutions themselves, that are really at the coal face in trying to provide the various services that need to be provided, et cetera. So by pooling all these resources together, I believe that we can end up in a situation where we can be much more effective in designing new creative uh, um, op options which spread the risk across the various parties concerned in a way which is much more consistent with their ability to take on the risk. Uh, and also just this, uh, provide a forum for exchanging ideas and views and, uh, and sharing innovation. At the end, uh, we all have a very similar and common interest. Thank you. Um, and I think perhaps we'll take one more question. And this is um, more of a cultural question, um, but it's about, you know, what, what can people in the capital markets do? Now, you've laid out a, a sort of very uh, sort of inspiring perspective of what, what the capital markets are capable of, um, if him as an example of, of it being able to achieve wonderful things. But, and, and you've talked about efforts going on to try and sort of replicate that or, bit, or create other achievements of a, of a similar kind. But um, people, you know, working in the capital markets, usually they have a short term target. They, they've, they've got a deal to win or a, uh, an investment performance target to reach for the quarter or whatever. So how can um, people of that kind contribute to this sort of um, innovation? That, that is a very good question. Uh, I, I believe that um, this is, I think historically it's, it's been a big, big challenge, uh, but I'm uh, cautiously optimistic and I'm optimistic uh, for a number of reasons. One, ESG has become a, a very uh, uh, important aspect of the governance of financial institutions, investment banks, commercial banks, and others. Regulators are focusing on this in a very, very direct way and they have expectations of the boards and management of, of financial institutions to, to incorporate this in their own strategies. And institutions themselves have shown a very strong interest in, in doing that. And you see this in the announcements that various financial institutions have been making at the highest levels. Um, so uh, I think what then needs to be done is to as institutions incorporate ESG in a very concrete way in their own domestic, in their own uh, strategies, we need to make sure that they explicitly try and pick this up as an area of focus, as opposed to looking and saying, look, you know, looking at much more generically, how much, you know, what sort of volume of green bonds have we done? What exclusions do we have in the types of lending that we do, et cetera. So I think there needs to be a much more granular approach towards ESG. And this is one aspect of it, which I would certainly encourage financial institutions to focus on. The second is clearly on the asset management side. Again, there the signs are very, very positive. If you look at asset management mandates, uh, close to half, I think it's 30, 40% now, include an ESG, explicit ESG requirement within them. Again, I think it, it's beholden on the, uh, on, on, uh, on the entities that have provided the funds to be managed to, uh, in a sense, require asset managers or expect of them to, uh, to look at this in a much more granular way and to say, look, we believe this has real value and the social benefits of this globally are, are very, very significant. And we can continue to get attractive, uh, close to market, if not market returns on this thing and encourage again, asset managers from their side to put pressure or to encourage investment banks to work together to try and develop instruments. Thank you, Cyrus. Um, I'm sure we all agree that that, that was a fascinating talk. Um, you're, it's it really encouraging to hear that um, there are so many uh, possibilities for capital markets to help um, areas of, of life that people people didn't expect or, or hadn't really dreamt of. Um, and, and we do have a concrete example in IFIM of something being achieved through financial engineering that is uh, unquestionably good. Um, so um, thank you so much for joining us, Cyrus. It was really interesting to talk to you. Um, and I'm sure uh, everybody will have um, had many thoughts provoked um, by, by uh, your ideas. 
Um, so thanks so much. And I would just like to say to the audience now, um, our next session uh, will be starting in 11 minutes. Uh, so if you go to the hub uh, screen and, and go to sessions, uh, and that's our panel on COVID-19 and social bonds. So uh, do join us for that in a moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cyrus. Thank you, John. Thank you very much indeed.